Oh, good. And just a uh, highlight for those of you who uh, last fall surely had put together another marvelous skit called Rosie the Riveter. And we did that, and it was such a hit that we just wanted to do kind of a, uh, a follow-up. And so uh, uh, we're so fortunate today, Shirley. Let me pass this on to you. And one of the reasons that turned out so well was because Mike was David Letterman in our skit. We went back through time with a local celebrity, which he did really well, and then our three Rosies appeared back in the 40s. It was fun. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. What I love to do is learn about history. And what I love to do is share what I learn about history through my writing. This skit hopefully will touch your hearts and have, have that bring to mind some things. Um, I'd like to tell you a couple things about it. My youngest daughter, my middle daughter, who's in the other room, she's our singer, said, Mom, she lives in Louisiana, just write me a part where I can sing. I'll come back and visit. That was my incentive for this one. I thought, OK, I can do that. Um, this is my oldest daughter, Sherry. She and her two friends from high school, Sandy and Jenny, they were high school buddies. Sherry is now a nurse at Good Sam's Hospital, so she actually edited some of the nursing things for us. Sandy is a mortgage lender, but she volunteers. <laughs> she volunteers for, with senior citizens. And when I said, well, this is a lot of seniors come up here, she said, oh, I'm on board. And Jenny, who's never done anything like this in her life, <laughs> when I asked her, she came to Rosie, and I said, would you like to be part of one? And she said, sure. And then when I called her, I figured she would just say, no, I'm too busy because I'm shy, and I would never do that. She goes, sure. And she's here, and I'm so excited. So she's kind of a newbie. Our um, singers are my daughter Elizabeth and her daughter Charlie. Charlie wasn't part of the plan, but when she found out we were doing it, she asked if she could sing. So we wrote her into the script. You will detect a southern accent when she sings. And her little sister is over here, Audrey, who was going to dance, but we couldn't figure out how to do that in this area, too. So she's part of that, too. And then our men are Jason and Sam Anderson, father and son. His wife was one of our Rosies. And she's at girls camp with our church. She should be home later today. So we got them. And I think that's about it. Good? OK. Let me start. Although American women never were forced to participate in World War II, thousands volunteered to serve. Among those were 59,000 nurses, women who risked their own lives to provide aid and comfort to the GI so far away from home. More than half of those 59,000 again volunteered to serve on the front lines, hospitals, overseas, and war zones. 16 were killed as a result of enemy action. 70 were held as prisoners of war by the Japanese for over three years. 1,600 won awards and decoration, including the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart. Over 200 of these women died while in military service. Most served because they thought it was their duty and they were fearless because they knew they were needed so urgently. This morning, we'd like to share personal stories of three nurses. Were they extra special? Did they achieve more than their peers? Did they receive special accommodations for their service? Not really. In fact, they were pretty ordinary. They were average in size, commitment, and even attitude. But we hope their stories will bring to mind what life was like for these women who helped win World War II. Each woman's story will hopefully touch your heart and help you understand and appreciate what she sacrificed, what she offered, and how she helped the soldier in her care. Most of the information that I used are, is from Evelyn M. Monahan and Rosemary Needle Greenlee's book, If I Perish, and it's in our library here on loan. This morning's presentation is dedicated to those 59,000 women, so their contributions will not perish in the halls of history, but instead be brought to light in her story, Frontline Army Nurses, World War II.
Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me, anyone else but me, anyone else but me. No, 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 don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me till I come marching home. Don't go walking down lover's lane. Hello, my name is Frances L. Nash and I am from the great state of Georgia. I graduated from nursing school during the depression and I couldn't find a job so I joined the army. That was in 1935. Five years later I re-enlisted. This year, this time for a two-year tour of duty in the Pacific, excuse me. At first it was paradise, tropical and warm. And then the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor and it became a war zone. Was I scared? Me, an independent, feisty Georgia farm girl, scared? No, I wasn't scared, I was angry. I remember after one raid, several of our hospital wards were completely wiped out, killing and injuring the patients and the staff. One ward was full of head case wounds, boys without ears, noses, and faces. I was never so mad. I wanted those Japs dead. Another time, American medics brought Japanese wounded to us. We let them keep all the American socks and underwear and watches they had on. Made me want to say something bad when I saw the laundry marks with the name of somebody I knew. That means that person was dead. I was so mad, I didn't have time to be frightened. I remember writing to my mama to tell her not to worry. I was an army nurse. I was where I wanted to be to help care for those casualties. I never expected to be taken prisoner. But on May 6, 1942, that's what happened to me and 66 other nurses. My commanding officer, Colonel Duckworth, told me to hide a lethal dose of morphine in my hair to keep the worst from happening. But thank God it never came to that. It's funny. Public opinion didn't think highly of nurses. It was a negative view held over from the American Revolution and the Civil War. It just was not considered a suitable profession for young unmarried women. It wasn't decent to be emptying bedpans and doing other disgusting things for people. And heaven forbid a young woman be exposed to male genitalia. How <laughs> sinful. My mama even said she'd not be able to hold her head up in public if a daughter became a nurse. They just didn't get it. The army wasn't much better. As a nurse, I received no military training. We were just expected to jump in and save lives. We weren't even issued our own uniforms. Instead, we got the men's castaways and we had to cinch them up and alter them to actually fit. My little sister Martha became a nurse and joined the Army too. At the age of 23, she became the chief nurse of the 44th Evacuation Hospital. By the time she joined, things were a little different. She got training on aircraft identification, map reading, and how to care for the wounded during a bombing attack. Her determination got her nurses blue Army Nurse Corps uniforms that even included pants to wear. I was so proud of her. What did we do as nurses? Well, besides medical care, we did those little things that made a difference to those boys. We held their hands, talked to them, gave back rubs, read books, wrote letters to their families helping them to come home. We even searched through cemeteries and mass graves for their IDs and clothes and supplies for those troops that were still in such a desperate need. I appreciated everything you did for me. You gave me comfort in a time of need. You saw past my body, riddled with bullets, face scarred, limbs missing. You saw me. You taught me I was still a soldier fighting a battle. You helped me to see past the clouds of discouragement and the fear. You helped me to banish the self-pity and self-consciousness. You, you gave me something to be cheerful about, something to smile about in a time of great fear. You helped me to live. Thank you. Trumpet man from Mount Chicago way. He had a boogie song that no one else could play. He was the top man at his craft. 
until his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, he's blowing Reveille. He's a boogie woogie boogie boy for Company B. They made him play a strum for his Uncle Sam. They really brought him down because he couldn't jam. The captain seemed to understand. Cause the next day the cap went out and drafted a band. And now the company jumps when he plays Reveille. He's a boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B. A do, a do, a doodly out a do. He blows they to the bar. The boogie rhythm can play out. Unless the bass guitar is playing with them. And now the company jumps when he was Reveille. He's a boogie woogie bugle boy from Company B. A do, a do. Hello, my name is Helen Maloney. I joined the Army the day after Pearl Harbor was attacked in December of 1941. During my service, I witnessed terrible injuries and scenes of devastation that have stayed with me throughout my lifetime. I was involved with the North Africa Campaign in 1942 that included, included the Tunisia attack and Sicilian Campaign in 1943 and the Normandy invasion in 1944. There were times when the hospital beds were filled to overwhelming, and all I could see was one stretcher after another. If I couldn't give painkillers, I dispensed cigarettes, and more often than not, it was the last one they smoked. A few months before, 56 Army nurses would land in Normandy with the 48th Surgical Team, we were given what was the closest thing to military training our nurses would get, a regimen of hardening exercises and five and 10 mile hikes complete with field packs. When our ship landed off the coast of North Africa, we watched the infantry division climb down a rope net from the starboard side of the ship. I hoped when it came time to turn for me to leave the ship that I'd get to use the iron ladder. It looked a lot more sturdy and with a pack on my back, I figured it would be easier. The chief nurse cautioned me to wait until the landing barge rose to the top of the wave before I stepped off the deck of the ship and onto the barge itself, which was an eight foot drop. With a 26 pound pack on my back, a helmet and extra equipment like surgical instruments and bandages, I knew I'd sink like a rock if I missed the barge and went into the sea. All of us shivered in the frigid November wind as it hit our wet clothes and drove the cold through our skin to the marrow of our bones. Sniper bullets bit into the sand around us as we ran toward a dilapidated beach shack built on a stilt about 75 yards away from the high water mark. I remember the day I looked into a makeshift operating room where they were working on a soldier with a compound leg fracture. The leg was elevated and the wound wide open. All of a sudden the nurse giving anesthesia fainted. I caught her before she hit the floor. Before I could revive her, the surgeon yelled at me to take her place. I had worked maternity in civilian life, but somehow I took to my new duties as if the OR was where I was always, where I had always been. With the 48th surgical team got to Constantine, Algeria, it was dark and cold. The nurses were told to sew a large cross out of sheets so it could be displayed on the ground near the hospital as we moved up the front lines. The Germans had respected the Geneva Convention so far and the cross would offer protections for patients and nurses. Under blackout conditions, we sewed 54 sheets together in teams of two till our fingers were purple with cold. There were days when, the only, when we only had a cup of water for our bathing and laundry needs. And one time I remember thinking the army must think we were army goats. We had to pitch our tents in the dark and when morning came discovered we were on a 45 degree angle on the side of a hill. 57 highly disgruntled nurses <laughs> complained ferociously and three hours later, the troops had repitched our tents on level ground. <laughs> Working in a combat zone was tough. Most of us adopted an attitude that if we got hit, we got hit. If we didn't get hit, we thank goodness. But we knew all the time we could be, we could be killed. We were in a combat zone all the time, and people got killed in combat zones. It was all about our patience, though. As our troops retreated from the Kasserine Pass during the Tunisia campaign in North Africa, we had over 6,500 Allied casualties to care for. The German troops were less than 15 miles away. I was so worn out, I remember vomiting in my helmet, then I rinsed it out, put it back on my head, and I continued to lift and help patients into trucks. It seemed we were always on a truck or a ship 
being transported to a new place to take care of our troops. Once I remember hearing a swishing sound overhead and looking up in time to see a low-flying German plane release a glider bomb that was headed for our ship. There was a terrible sound of wood splintering and metal buckling all the, at the right front starboard bow of the ship. The bomb hit, but thank God, it was a dud. It didn't explode. There, really, there was really no way to be trained with it for it all. We just did our best and kept forward, going forward with the duties of caring for our patients. In many ways, seeing a boy whose mind had been shattered by combat was even more difficult than working with shattered bodies. I was caring for a young, blue-eyed, blonde-haired 20-year-old who was experiencing shell shock. A soldier next to me put his hand on my arm and said, thanks for being gentle with him. We've been in the same company for months. He's usually a quiet guy, but a day ago, when we were catching up pretty bad, he climbed out of his foxhole and started shaking his fist at the German planes. He removed his hand and looked down towards his own missing right leg, then continued, I'd rather be like this than like he is. I replied, you're both heroes to me. It's been a privilege to take care of all of you. You gave me hope. Your smile was just as good as any medicine that you gave me. You're the reason why we fought so violently. Why, even when the odds were against us, we continued to fight in battle, and we continued to go on with our duties. If it weren't for you nurses, many of us would have just given up. As I lay in my cot, wounded, suffering from the wounds of battle, I watched you for hours tear, care for the bodies and soldiers whose noses and mouths had been blown off in battle. I watched as you spent hours feeding them, giving them the nourishment that they needed. I gnashed my teeth at this war as I watched you comfort the living dead to give them a moment of peace before they passed away. <sighs> a fatal bullet would have been more merciful than the pain that they had to endure. <sighs> the service that you gave us, words can't even express the, the gratitude that we have for you nurses. My name is Evelyn Anderson and my friends call me Andy. I joined the army when I was 28 and had to fight my way in. And at 5'3 and 107 pounds, they told me I was four pounds underweight. I had to convince them being skinny was a family trait, and I was very healthy and able to serve my country as a nurse. On March 16, 1942, I was ordered to Fort Meade in Maryland and got three weeks of training before I was shipped overseas. My time in the service flew by. There were times when days blurred with nights, and we lived on coffee, sea rations, and very little sleep. One of the first places I served seemed like it was plagued by bad luck. It rained steadily, and we waded in mud almost up to our knees. Our sterilizing tent caught fire one night and presented a grand target for the Germans. One of my friends, Lieutenant McLaughlin, got sick and ran a high temperature. A <clears throat> with the intense abdominal pain. The doctor thought it was acute appendicitis, but she insisted her appendix was removed as a teenager. We were stunned and saddened as we watched her condition deteriorate over several days and we watched her die. We didn't have time to mourn. In full battle dress, helmet, strapped, helmet straps unfastening and dangling on the sides of our faces, 41 nurses of 93rd Evacuation Hospital stood at the rail of the cargo ship United States Army Transport, New Me <coughs> Mexico, as we entered the Gulf of Gelia, Sicily on July 13, 1943. Three days before American and British troops had stormed the beach, I remembered as we waited to go ashore, we watched the U.S. Navy ships fire unseen at unseen enemy on shore. Around 
Each heavy discharge from the ship's big gun shock waves were set off across, across the Gulf waters. Ships burned, aged pieces of debris bobbed and floated everywhere. Between the wood, metal, and tatters of shoes and clothing, the bloated bodies of American soldiers clad in olive drab floated face down. I heard that Eisenhower had worried if the American public discovered its daughters had gone ashore on D-Day in North Africa and again in Sicily, there might be such a negative outcry it would be impossible to assign any army nurses whatsoever to a con any combat zone. So Eisenhower made his decision as a politician instead of as a soldier. He left the American public in the dark. We had had they had known, we waited ashore, arriving on the beach, soaking wet and looking like sad sacks, they would have protested. Our beds that night were made from bales of straw, and the next thing we knew, German planes were overhead. Bombs fell and two hit near my bed. We ran for the foxholes and nearby slit trenches as fast as we could. The odor of decaying flesh was absolutely nauseating. We covered our noses and mouths with handkerchiefs, but it didn't help much. I don't think I'll ever get those pictures and odors completely out of my mind. Even worse were the bloated bodies of dead American soldiers waiting for the graves registration crews to come along and collect them. Somebody's son, brother, or sweetheart swollen and decaying in the oven-like heat. You don't forget things like that. You don't like to, but you don't. The bugs were unbearable. If anyone was squeamish about bugs, they had to get over it fast. We might have complained, but it didn't do much good. I remember spending a night on the truck that bounced so badly that none of us got any sleep. We got to our quarters and discovered the PX had almost nothing a woman might want or need. In fact, the manager asked us to make up a list of things we should stock, or they should stock. The first thing on the list was a requisition of a dozen curity cloth diapers. Feminine products, such as sanitary pads, were never stocked at most post exchanges. And it was up to each individual army nurse to make certain that she had a good stand-in of cloth curity diapers. We found and purchased the washable cloth diapers that would also double as turbans in the heat and dusters in, at future hospital sites. The turbans kept the fleas and lice out of our hair, but, no protect, but it was no protection against the shrapnel or falling flak. Some of the illnesses we had to treat besides gunshot wounds were gangrene, malaria, fever, shell shock, and trench foot, effects from mustard gas and gonorrhea and syphilis. Penicillin didn't reach the front lines until late 1943, so patients had to be treated with arsenic, sulfa, and basbuth that was often ineffective. 5% or 750,000 of the 15 million men that registered for the draft had one type of venereal disease or another. That information was kept from the American public, too. One of our doctors, Captain Stanley F. Earp, found an alternative to replacing eyes that had been damaged in combat. Instead of glass eyes, he made a new one out of clear acrylic resin that was also used for dentures. Colored it and matched it to the other eye. From start to finish, it took him less than four days, and his artificial eye was less likely to break or get infected. Our standard treatment for shell shock that was also called battle fatigue, war neurosis, or soldier's heart was to keep the patient heavily sedated with large doses of barbiturates and to put to bed only awaken to eat or eliminate. One of my friends, Lieutenant Helen English, was in charge of two tents with ca these casualties. When exhausted, soldiers were finally awakened. They saw her walking around their tent, not even flinching at the sounds of the heaviest barrage. And most of them decided that if she could do it, so could they, and returned to their frontline units. 
I know our young boys with amputated limbs, loss of eyesight, and disfig disfiguring facial wounds gauged how their sweetheart and families might respond to them by the way the nurses reacted to their wounds. We showed them that the changes of war that the war caused could not stop them from being loved or accepted. Many young amputee found the courage to write home about their injuries after being assured by the nurses that their wounds made them him no less of a man. As nurses, we knew our words and sincerity gave the men the hope they needed to face the future. We suffered pneumonia, bronchitis, and trench foot along with these soldiers. We cried with them, we cheered them on, and we did what we could do. What you did for us, we appreciated. War isn't just about putting the enemy away and keeping our families and country safe and free. It's personal. It makes men out of boys and in turn turns us into callous and hardened killers. If it weren't for the nurses, we wouldn't be fit to return home. We'd be damaged goods and worthless as husbands and fathers. So what happened to the nurses after the war when they returned home? Were they greeted with ticker tape parades? Were they encouraged to take advantage of the GI Bill and get fresh starts on their lives? Were they given accommodations at veterans hospitals who specialized in gynecology or women's issues or even their own hospital gowns or bathrooms? Sadly, no. Lieutenant Francis Nash who suffered three and a half years in the Japanese internment camp in Manila, received no help from the VA. Lieutenant Helen Maloney married an army pilot. Hugh Richard had two sons and lived in Florida. She passed away in December of 2002 without any public recognition. And Evelyn Anderson married shortly after the war. She too retired to Florida quietly and without fame. These 59,000 nurses took back their roles as wives and mothers, daughters and sisters, changed forever by what they witnessed in horrific conditions. They sacrificed their youth, their innocence, for the cause they believed in. They softened the pain and gave hope to the soldiers in their care and made a difference in the life of those who survived the battles in Africa, Italy, France, Germany, and the Pacific. We salute these women and hope you will remember her story as she stood alongside your father, your grandfather, your uncle, your friend, those who fought in World War II to keep our country free. And come on back. And we're back. Thank you all. Now, doesn't that just be just reading it in a book? <laughs> Are there any questions to either the people that performed or even the ish some of the questions you might think of about the nurses that served? Or does anybody have a, a relative or a story of someone in their own family that served in the military? No. Okay. <laughs> After Rosie, we had lots of questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, how are we doing on time, Mike? How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing fine. Do we want to show that video then? Or what? Maybe what we'll do is, why don't we at, at this point, we'll take the chairs up, come visit with everyone here. Uh, and we do have a video which was made back in 1940s uh, about the story of Army nurses. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and play that up on our uh, large screen TV. But I think now's the time to just come and visit with everyone uh, and uh, just enjoy uh, the, yes. Oh, yes, please. Just to highlight, we did have uh, a while ago, uh, one of our speakers had served in the 94th General Hospital in, in France during World War II. And she had highlighted, actually she was a dietitian there, which was still very important, but she highlighted that on Christmas Eve, uh, they were bombed by you know, a, a German plane that came over. And, and again, just, you know, you always were in danger, no matter where you were. And so that was so marvelous. Whoops. Oh, yes. Great. Frances Nash. She was in that era, and pretty much when she joined the service, she thought it was going to just be getting away from the farm playing tennis on Pearl Harbor on one of the islands, and then when the Japanese did bomb it, it was a war zone. Um, the book specifically that I researched did not have um, anything directly involved. You had some I think she was at Corregidor when the Japanese attacked, and that's where most of her combat experience, well, all of her combat experience happened, because she was captured on May 6th May or 6th, 8th, 6th and uh, spent the rest of the war in concentration. Uh, in fact, uh, on the second page of your handout there, it highlighted um, you know, Navy nurses. And they were pretty much in Guam and the Philippines, and most of them became prisoners of war uh, during the Second World War. You know, I don't have all the details, Mike. Did you want to take a little bit of that? They let them keep treating each other. They had to make do. I know that they were cut off from other supplies, so they were in the jungle. And so they would move the camps and the cots to wherever they could. So sometimes they had what was called open-air hospitals, and they'd treat them. But then once they were held captive, we don't have a whole lot of what happened during the, the actual caption, captive part. But I know it was tough, and they hung out there with the guys. I mean, they, they had it just as bad. They were right there in the trenches with the boys. So, yeah, it was what, a tough gig. What was the one thing we learned while we were doing it about the trenches? The, the, oh, the slit, slit. slit trenches, basically, is where it, um, the, the slit trenches that I read um, is basically when they were getting bombed, they were basically going where you would go to the bathroom. <laughs> so they were taking cover in the toilets, basically. <laughs> that dawned on us when we were reading and we kind of all went, ew. <laughs> 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 Question back here. Um, what type of uh, treatment did the Japanese have on the, present, uh, uh, on the nurses? Did they treat them good or not so good? Harsh. My understanding was the nurses did their duty and they treated all the soldiers with as much objectivity as they could, but they were human, so I'm sure they did it with clenched teeth and maybe tears in their heart, but they did give those soldiers treatment. My but question how, were the nurses, how were the nurses treated? I'm not sure. Probably harsh. Probably pretty harsh. Well, if the captain gave her morphine. morphine to put in her hair to use, the implication or the inference is that they would have been treated Suicide. very Fertilized. poorly. Yeah. Right. So that was their way out. So it must have been pretty <clears throat> bad. Anybody else? Yes? Barbara Cockle was the only caller of spring. Has done very detailed research. Any other 
your questions. Well, just as just a final, we'd like to present each of you just with one of our museum challenge coins. Oh, thank you. So thank, thank you so you. much so for gorgeous. everything. Thank you. And thank certainly, you. Shirley. Thank you. Libby, here we go. Go get one. Charlie, go get one. Thank you. Mike, thank you. One more. Yes. Oh, and Charlie, too. Of course. Charlie, we'll give you one with a little case there. So thank you all so much. Thank you. visit, uh, talk with our, certainly our players here, and any questions.